grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, today I'm going to attempt to tackle um, a few of probably the most difficult doctrines in the New Testament to kind of look at and dig up and see what we can learn and see what we can glean from these two. But when I get to heaven, I think that I probably won't care. Once I get there, I'll be like, oh, never mind. Do you know all the questions you're gonna ask? And then when you get there, you're just gonna be like, yeah, never mind. Because we're gonna have all that knowledge and, and our faith is gonna become fact. But there's two things I wanna ask in today. Maybe my questions will change tomorrow. But I wanna know what First Peter chapter 3, verse 19 means when he says the spirits that are in prison. And I also want to know what Hebrews 6 is all about. <laughs> and so we're going to take a look at, at those two today. Um, but I'm in good company because there are people way smarter than me, scholars, who still wrestle with these things. And I think that's important for us to realize that there are some things in God's word that are going to be sort of mysterious and some things that were, are going to be harder to understand than those things that are clear cut and easy. And we're going to see that today. And no, I am not talking about submission. <laughs> um, but I know that you've all been waiting for that topic. So, and that's the first thing that we're going to, how many of you are just like, oh, here we go. Like you thought about maybe like, should I come? Like, maybe I'll just skip today, you know, because I know what she's going to be talking about. And, um, and it's the first thing that he says, as soon as I get there, um, it's the first couple verses that he uses in First Peter chapter 3. Okay, come on. Sorry, I should have had this opened already. Um, is talking about the submission to our husband. So let's look at the first couple verses. Wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands that if even if some do not obey the word that they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they, um, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Now, the first thing that we see here is he's going off of what he just left in chapter two, because in chapter two, he shows us, he talks to us about submission to the government. He talks to us about submission, employee to boss, master to servant. Um, he, he's going through that section of how we're to be submissive because all of us, believers, non-believers alike, we are all called to be submissive. And so in that, um, in that submission, he's now coming to chapter 3, and he's saying, likewise, wives, we are supposed to be submitted to our husbands. And now, especially in our culture today, sometimes that is a big rub against our culture right now, isn't it? But God, in his word, he has laid out an order to our families, an order to the church. God always has order to what he's doing. Why? so that it's not chaotic, so that there's an, there's an order of things done, and this is the order. The husband is to lead his family. That's his role, our role, to be submissive. He's to lead with understanding. We're to be submissive as unto the Lord, and we're going to take um, a look at that. So we're to submit to our husbands, and he gives us um, a purpose in it. He says that if they do not obey the word, though they're being disobedient, whether they're unsaved which he's clearly talking about here or whether they're just disobeying and they're just maybe wrong about something he's saying without a word meaning that we're not going to be preachy we're not going to nag we're not going to be using God's word as a weapon that we are to that he would be one by looking at our chaste behavior the chaste conduct of the wives and when I think about this I think about when we're to speak because the question always arises, well, am I then just supposed to agree with him? Am I then just supposed to become this mousy little, you know, person that never gets a say so? No, but the, we take scripture and we interpret it with other scripture. There's scripture about us submitting to one another. There's scripture about us speaking the truth in love. You know, if we just speak the truth, it can be really harsh. 
And, but we say, well, that's the truth. Yeah, but you just wounded. But we can speak the truth in love, which means we're not being just loving and passive and, and not acting, but we're speaking the truth in love. And we can do that with our husbands. We can come to our husbands and say, okay, this is what I'm seeing. This is the wisdom I feel like God's given me. But at the end of the day, make no mistake, our husbands stand or fall to the Lord for their position within our family, not us. Even if I submit to my husband when he's wrong, God still sees that as precious. Even when he's wrong and God can work that out, God can deal with, with him. So he gives us this purpose that our husbands would be one <clears throat> by our chaste conduct. And often we think, we come to the conclusion, and you've heard women say it, you might say it too, well, then what? I just have to be quiet now? Well, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> like, that's not going to happen. I have thoughts. I have emotion. I'm part of the equation in my marriage. I have wisdom to bring to the table. I have God's wisdom to bring to the table. I have, I have opinions. And my husband can hear those, but then ultimately he has to make that complete decision. I'm not to be quiet, but... Peter then goes on and he gives us kind of the how of how we are to um, pull this chaste behavior off. Let's read verses three and four. He says, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. When we, it, it tells us here the how, that we are to focus on our conduct. That's who we are. Who are we in Christ at a heart level? That's to be our focus. That the result is that we'll have a gentle and quiet spirit, that we're gonna have this inner beauty that's gonna be attractive to our husband. Now, you're gonna win him to Christ. Now, an outward beauty, we might win our him to ourselves, but when we have an inner beauty, we're going we're gonna to point him to Jesus Christ. That's what he, Peter is getting at here, that it's not about how we necessarily look because that's corruptible. Those things are going to fade. And if you're over 40, you understand this. These things fade. I look at pictures now and I'm like, oh my goodness, who is the old lady? I love it when I go places with my grandkids. I took them on a field trip this week. And as we were going in, the lady says, now make sure you stay with your mom. And, and I said, oh, I'm their grandma. And she said, oh, I'm sorry. And I said, no, no, no. I tell people that, that I'm their grandma so that you can say, well, you look so young. <laughs> like, to be a grandma, like I'm trying to get something out of this. Like... <laughs> Because uh, everybody will say, okay, now stay with your mother. And it's like, oh, you did not look closely. Because I go, there's a mom in between them and me. And, and she actually looks young. Hers isn't corrupt yet. Um, <clears throat> but this thing that we have on us, it's temporary. And it's so good, especially in the area of submission, to understand that this is corruptible. It's not incorruptible. Our inner beauty, that's incorruptible. That's something that is going to last. It's about who we are in Christ. And the, um, we are, the, the word submit, when we hear that, like, I think it's become almost like Pavlov's dogs in the church. Like, we hear the word submit, and all of a sudden, we stiffen up a little. Because let's be honest, it's difficult. I don't know about you, but it's not easy for me. Because number one, I like to be right. Number two, I love a good argument. Like, because you want to be right, right? You just love a good argument. I love a good debate. I have opinions. Number three, if I'm going to be honest, I want my own way. I just want it my way. Sometimes it's because I know my husband's wrong. And so I just want to say, we need to do it this way because I'm right. And all of these things that we struggle with, you guys have your own things that you struggle with. Now, 
I would suggest, and so does Peter here in the text, that we don't focus necessarily on submission, but that we focus on who we are in Christ. Because once we focus on who we are in Christ and we focus on our chaste conduct, that submission is going to be a byproduct of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. We're on display and we're displaying Jesus who is hidden in our hearts. That word adorn, it means to put in order, arrange, to make ready. That word chaste is, a, is an exciting reverence. It's pure from carnality. It's modest. Those two together means that we're preparing ourselves in this modesty, in this um, rejecting the carnality, in letting the Holy Spirit develop that inner beauty within us. So Peter is saying, you want to show your husband something beautiful? Show him a joy-filled, Jesus-following, purity-driven, modest gal whose heart is set on God. That he will be won over to Christ. It won't be, it'll be irresistible. He won't be able to, but to see what you have in Christ. Let God work those things out in our husbands. Let him do the work. He's so good at doing it in us. He can, he's capable of handling it in, in them. That's, that's beautiful. Our inner beauty, it's very precious to God. That word precious, he uses it a lot in chapter three, and it means great value not wasted so much time is wasted on how we look on the outside marketing is billions and billions of dollars are spent in intriguing you to spend so much time on our outer beauty how much time are we giving to developing and shaping our inner beauty how much time are we giving to that our chaste behavior will produce the most fruit in our marriage. If we set ourselves apart and we have that chaste behavior, it's going to produce fruit. Now, the other day, as I was reading, of course, the Bible teacher is going to get the lesson that week, right? So as we were, I'm reading through and doing my homework in chapter 3, Ted and I have a discussion about finances, which I hate, I'm the one that's just like, he says the word finance. I cover my ears and I'm like, la, 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 la. Like, I don't want to know. I always tell him, like, just tell me when I can't do that anymore. Like, <laughs> when that stops working, like, give me a clue. But until then, like, just keep all that to yourself. I don't want to know. But, you know, from time to time, you have to be a grown-up and talk about finance. So we're talking, and I have opinions, and I think I'm right. And then the Lord brought this to focus on your chaste behavior and I went okay and so I'm standing in the kitchen and I said you know what the Lord's telling me that I just need to surrender this I just need to give this over to you and you know all the information and you know my opinions and whatever you decide we're gonna go with I'm I'm completely surrendered well he looked at me like I was going to poison him that night <laughs> Like, he just kind of looked at me like, it can't possibly be that easy. <laughs> like, I'm going to slip him something later, you know, in his drink. Uh, he was looking at me like, is that a trick question? And I said, no, the Lord's just doing a work in my heart, and I'm just going to surrender this. You decide. I'm going to follow. And you know what? The argument was over. He gets to make the decision. And you know what it brought me? I didn't feel mousy. I didn't feel... Um, like I wasn't valuable. I actually felt peace. I felt that the Lord was telling me, well done, this is precious in my sight, and it brought me joy. It brought me that joy. It brought me that reverence, knowing, God, I obeyed you. It doesn't even matter what he does. What matters is that I obeyed. Now, right now, more than ever, in our society, we need women who are set apart for God. I mean, I don't even have to say the words Super Bowl and impeachment trial to get you to understand that we need godly women, women of the Bible, women that wake up and say, I'm going to follow God at all costs, and you can make fun of me, and you can tell me that I'm weak all day long, but this is what 
I'm going to do. Do you know that on that, so how many of you watched the Super Bowl halftime show? Do you know that that is the highest sex trafficking night of the year? And I thought, what are we telling our women about who we are supposed to be? Now, some people are like, okay, what did you expect? They're not Christian. Totally get that. But even just as a woman, like the fact that I had to remove my nine-year-old grandson because he was watching a grandma dance on a pole, like that's degrading even, I mean, you know something's nasty when even the world calls it nasty. Like at that point, what are we saying? The ropes, the, I mean, what are we doing to our society just in general? They need an example. They're lost. Lost people act lost. They're lost, but we're not. We know who we have found, and we can portray that. Now, we're going to jump down to verse 18 because I do want to get into a couple of really difficult doctrines. And I wanted to skip this like nobody's business, and the Lord just kept bringing me back to this section, and I know he has something for us. So we're going to jump down to verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, and just the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient. When once the divine suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, with, in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through the water, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of filth of the flesh. He's saying not that you go into water and that you're cleansed, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. It's a heart issue through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of the Father, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Do you know that that's the best place for Christ to be for us is in heaven, being able to guide us and direct us and be at the right hand of the Father. Now, I just need to say up front when we go through these doctrines that we don't actually know what is the right translation, but I don't think that that means that we should just put it aside and not think through it. Like, let's wrestle with it. Let's look at it and see what some of these interpretations are and then maybe make a decision, maybe not. Maybe just know what the Bible is saying. Verse 19, it says that there were spirits in prison. Who are these spirits? It was one of your questions, and you may have been confused. Like, I have no idea who these spirits are. Now, Chuck Smith, I love so much and admire what he said. I was listening to a message of his, and he said he came to this section and one that I'm going to go to in Hebrews 6. I think it was his Hebrews 6 message, and he said, we just don't know. I would love to stand up here and tell you I know exactly what this is. There's a few different interpretations, but sometimes in Scripture, we just don't know. And it's okay to say, I just don't know. We're going to have to figure that out later. Here are a few. I'll present you with a few of what scholars and commentators and people that I listen to um, would say, and then we can wrestle with it in our groups. But just know that we use scripture to interpret scripture. So on the doubtful scriptures, you never go headlong and say, okay, this is what it's saying and, and hold on to that. We have to take other scripture and the whole counsel of God and we don't push the doubtful ones aside for the ones that are really clear. There's things in scripture that are really clear that we know what it says, that we know what it means and we hang our hats there and we take some of these ones that we're like, we're not sure of the interpretation and we just ask God to work those things out. Now, Chuck Smith, his take is that when it's the spirits in prison, it was that there were sort of two camps, the just and the unjust, one in Abra Abraham's bosom that would be comfort, the other would be um, the unbelievers. And he has said, his take is that Jesus went and preached to the spirit the gospel that he was preaching the gospel to these spirits and that he was there to set the captives free and you go okay that seems to make sense that's one interpretation and that the believers went from being the comfort into um into 
he was able to preach the gospel to him. David Guzik, if you read his commentaries, he said that it was the demonic spirits. And if you want to turn to Genesis 6 really quick, I can show you where he got that from. So pop over to Genesis 6. We'll read it really fast for context. Now it came to pass, verse 1, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men and they were, that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves and all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with men forever, for he was indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men that they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men of old, the men of renown. And the Lord saw that this wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of thought of heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. He was grieved in his heart so that the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both men and beasts, creeping thing, bird in the air. I am sorry, for I have made it. But Noah found grace in his sight. And he goes on to talk about how there were these fallen angels and that they went into the daughters and made these giants. And so when David Guzik is talking about demonic spirits, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about that um, particular issue. Others say that it was human spirits, unbelievers from the flood that were disobedient. And now this is a message of judgment that God went down and he preached a message of judgment. Joe Foch, he, he said there were three major views and then there's a lot of other views, but he sort of broke it down. I'll, I'll present two to you. One is that just like, kind of what Pastor Chuck Smith says, that Christ went to Hades between his crucifixion and resurrection. And if you think of two compartments, the just and the unjust, that he preached the good news, the gospel. But Joe Foch makes the argument that we never, um, that, um, that the people of God wouldn't be in Hades, that Abraham's bosom would have been in heaven. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. That's his argument. But some say that it's the Old Testament saints, that they were like that they were enlightened and that they knew doctrine and they never came to that full knowledge of Christ. Now, I want you to turn now to um, Hebrews chapter 6. One of the things that Joe Foch said is that um, that Jesus tells us that the righteous go up and the condemned go down. And he said he wasn't preaching to souls, that he didn't evangelize. He made a proclamation to the spirits that were disobedient, the fallen angels in the days of Noah. And so um, I just wanted to go back to clear this up. And so the, this, angelic, um, this angelic being, this fallen angel, was trying to interfere with the messianic line. That's sort of his take. He's a little different because he said fallen angels are kind of different than demonic spirits. So he and Guzik, even these are three Calvary Chapel guys that kind of differ in this way. So why is it important to us? Well, one of the biggest questions that we face as believers is asking the question, can a person lose their salvation? We always want to know, can a person lose their salvation? We see people that come to the Lord, the knowledge of the Lord, and then um, we see them walk away. We see them what maybe we think is them not following the Lord. So turn to Hebrews chapter 6. And if you think 1 Peter 3.19 had several different interpretations, this one uh, puts that one to shame. 
Um, there are many scholars that just really don't know, again, on this particular scripture. Hebrews chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. He's saying, like, you got to leave some of the baby stuff and you need to dig in. This is our application for us today. Like we need to like lean in to some of these doctrines and it's, it's easy for us to go, you know what, I just want Jesus. I just want to love, I, I can't tell you countless people, like can't we just love Jesus? No, we need to dig into some of these things so that we know what they're saying. Verse four, for it is impossible for those who once were enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, and they put him to open shame. For the earth, for the earth which drinks in the rain, and it often comes up upon it, bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is it is burned. Now, at first read, if you're me, you go, can people lose their salvation? I'm reading that, and I'm like, okay, what does this mean? A few of the top um, interpretations of this scripture, some say that might be the Jewish believers, that they were enlightened, they knew doctrine, but they never came to a full knowledge of Jesus Christ so they missed it even though they they knew the Bible they knew all these things they never fully came others say um, it's like the parable of the sower some fell by the wayside you know the seed went out some got choked out some kind of took root but then it never like fully took root and so these are some of the interpretations but what I want you to see in this text is more of a big idea. I want you to see what it doesn't say. What it doesn't say is that a person can lose their salvation, and we need to really wrap our heads around that and understand it. When God gives us eternal life, it's eternal. It's forever. You can't give back something that's eternal. When you become a believer, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That is our down payment. That is what he has given us so that we are with him forever. So it's not about my work. It doesn't matter so much. I gave up my sin and I replaced it with God's righteousness. It's not no longer based on my righteousness. So you can see where the Jews, everything was based on the law and everything is about them being right and them doing, that they would crucify Christ over and over again because it would be like, you know, I, I have to do this and I have to do this and I have to keep the law and I have to keep law. And, and the word is saying, but that puts God to public shame over and over and over again when we just try to do these things in our own strength, that we need his whole counsel you can't give it back. Jesus died once for all. We have so many scriptures that talk about that. When he talks about this falling away, it's more like a drifting, that there's a drifting that we can take. But what we can take from this, what we can't take is that he's talking about salvation, but what we can take from this is warning. J. Vernon McGee says this. He says that there are believers and there are make-believers. Isn't that interesting? There are believers and there are make-believers. Now we know in scripture that even the demons believed and trembled, right? We know in scripture that, um, that Judas himself was a betrayer. I was, I'll give you some examples of this real life. I was on a worship team in the first church we planted for about eight years. I sang next to this man and um, he would come every week. He knew the word of God. He would lead people in worship. And you would have thought he was saved. Do you know two years after 
we planted this church, he came back to Ted and he confessed, I was doing all of that and I was not born again. That God had showed him that he had not been born again. My own testimony, I was thinking back to this last night and I was thinking, you know, I remember at the Presbyterian Church in Redondo Beach where we got married, we attended church. And I remember even going to a Bible study. But you know what? I wasn't a believer. I was doing the right things. I was going. I was learning God's word. I was even attending church. And sometimes the, the rituals of our Christianity can make us think that we're born again. But I wasn't born again. Now, the filling of the Spirit, being baptized in the Spirit, that can come at salvation or it can come after, but I'm talking about just getting saved. And I remember sitting in there and I was about to take communion and the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, this has to be real for you to take this. And I remember thinking, I didn't know really know the terms born again at that point, but I remember thinking like, okay, this has to be genuine. This has to be in my heart, not just something that I do. John 3, Three says, Jesus replied, truly, truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born again. The kingdom of God unless he is born again. Sometimes we come into church, to Christian church from other denominations. Sometimes, maybe you're here, you've never been to church. This is your first experience. But you hear a message, you're not going to know those things. Like, I didn't know those things until the word of God brought them out. I didn't know I needed to be born again. I didn't know that I needed to ask Christ into my heart so that he could do the transforming work. I didn't know those things. Maybe you have been enlightened. Maybe you know the lingo. Maybe you go to church regularly, but you're not born again. You haven't been sealed with the Holy Spirit. You are not in Christ. I think there's many Christians walking around in our nation in this state in this place where they're not born again, but they think they are. Listen, there's nothing more difficult than trying to be a Christian when you're not. That's a difficult task, when we're trying to be a Christian when we're not. There is true repentance of sin. There is a belief that Jesus is the Son of God. When we believe he died in our place on the cross, when we believe that he was raised from the dead, when we accept that into our hearts, He does a transforming work. He takes our heart of stone and he makes it soft. He comes in and he now resides within us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Has this verse scared you a time or two? But... The one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? Did we not do um, many things in your name? We did all these things, and now what are we left with? What is it that we're left with? You know, Jesus, Judas did some of those same things. We can do the things of Christ and then not know him. And so what do we do about that? We can do those great works. And he says in verse 23, and then they will declare, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's dead works. That's what he's talking about here in in, in Hebrews 6, if we, have, if we don't have Christ in us, then our works are dead. Our works are dead. Hebrews 6 tells us in the beginning of those verses, he wants us to grow up and go beyond our elementary thinking. Are you doing the mighty works in his name, but your works are dead without the Spirit of God dwelling in you? Do you have a profession, but you don't have a possession? Is that where we're at? There's no need for Christ to die on the cross over and over and over again. He said that he died once for all. When we're sealed, that's it, it's settled. Our salvation is secure. Nobody can take that away from you. No one can take away what God, once God dwells within me, within my soul. 
There's no need for a sinner to repent over and over again unto salvation. Now we repent, but that repentance to salvation is once and for all. For those that are believers, are we living like that? Are we living in a way that says there's no question who that person belongs to? There's no question who I belong to. When we are born again, like no, we're saved from this wicked world and we're sealed for the day of redemption. And the Bible says today is the day of salvation. So we say, well, why is that important to us? It's important to you and I because number one, there are people all around that maybe think they're believers, but they don't have Christ in them. They go to church, they do all the things, and Ted always likes to say, you know, when you surround yourself with believers, sometimes you, th you feel like their, their energy, so to speak, you feel Christ in them, and you can think and have this false thing, like, yeah, I'm one of them. But until we come to repentance, and here's the thing, we don't know what kind of flood is gonna come tomorrow in our lives. That's why he says today is the day of salvation because we don't know what kind of flood. And just like those spirits in prison, you may be in captivity thinking that you're free. But unlike those spirits that he preached to, and maybe that was a message of judgment, which some say that that was a message of judgment that he went and preached to them, but today you don't have a message of judgment because there's still time. Unlike those prison prisoners, we can be set free. We can know that we have this salvation within us. Jesus came to make us whole forever, forever. And the world desperately needs real Christians to contain the power of God, to be filled with the Spirit, and to be set apart for him. Now, Peter, when he started his chapter 3, he, what did he say? This is a beautiful thing. When we have Christ in us, when we have that inner beauty, it's attractive to people, and our husbands aren't lost on that. So it goes full circle all the way back. Our friends need this, our coworkers, our neighbors, our community. And if you're trying to do it without Christ in us, it will be the most difficult thing you try to do because you're going to have to crucify Christ over and over and over again we get the living god that dwells within us and i want to give you an opportunity because some of you may be here and you may be in that position where you're like i am going through all these motions but i really don't know if i'm born again and then i also want to give us an opportunity to just have people pray over us and i'll do this after just where you're at to pray over us for a fresh filling of his holy spirit 